Section 15 of Some Answered Questions. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Carolyn Bridgewater. Some Answered Questions by Abdul Baha. Translated by Laura Clifford Barney. Section 15. Chapter 34. Peter's Confession of Faith. Question. In the Gospel of St. Matthew it is said, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. What is the meaning of this verse? Answer. This utterance of Christ is a confirmation of the statement of Peter when Christ asked, Whom do you believe me to be? And Peter answered, I believe that thou art the Son of the living God. Then Christ said to him, Thou art Peter. Note, it is well known that Peter's real name was Simon, but Christ called him Cephas, which corresponds to the Greek word Petrus, which means rock. End note. For Cephas in Aramaic means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church. For the others in answer to Christ said that he was Elias, and some said John the Baptist, and some others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Christ wished by suggestion or an allusion to confirm the words of Peter, so on account of the suitability of his name Peter, he said, And upon this rock I will build my church, meaning thy belief that Christ is the Son of the living God will be the foundation of the religion of God, and upon this belief the foundation of the church of God, which is the law of God, shall be established. The existence of the tomb of Peter in Rome is doubtful. It is not authenticated. Some say it is in Antioch. Moreover, let us compare the lives of some of the popes with the religion of Christ. Christ, hungry and without shelter, ate herbs in the wilderness, and was unwilling to hurt the feelings of any one. The Pope sits in a carriage covered with gold, and passes his time in the utmost splendor, amidst such pleasures and luxuries, such riches and adoration, as kings have never had. Christ hurt no one, but many of the Popes killed innocent people, refer to history, how much blood the popes have shed, merely to retain temporal power. For mere differences of opinion they arrested, imprisoned, and slew thousands of the servants of the world of humanity, and learned men who had discovered the secrets of nature, to what a degree they opposed the truth. Reflect upon the instructions of Christ, and investigate the habits and customs of the popes. Consider, is there any resemblance between the instructions of Christ and the manner of government of the popes? We object to criticizing, but the history of the Vatican is very extraordinary. The purport of our argument is this, that the instructions of Christ are one thing, and the manner of the papal government is quite another. They do not agree. See how many Protestants have been killed by the order of the popes. How many tyrannies and oppressions have been countenanced and how many punishments and tortures have been inflicted. Can any of the sweet fragrances of Christ be detected in these actions? No, in the name of God. These people did not obey Christ, while St. Barbara, whose picture is before us, did obey Christ, and followed in his footsteps, and put his commands into practice. Among the popes there are also some blessed souls who followed in the footsteps of Christ, particularly in the first centuries of the Christian era, when temporal things were lacking and the tests of God were severe. But when they came into possession of governmental power and worldly honor and prosperity were gained, the papal government entirely forgot Christ and was occupied with temporal power, grandeur, comfort, and luxuries. It killed people, opposed the diffusion of learning, tormented the men of science, obstructed the light of knowledge, and gave the order to slay and to pillage. Thousands of souls, men of science and learning, and sinless ones, perished in the prisons of Rome. With all these proceedings and actions, how can the vicarship of Christ be believed in? The papal see has constantly opposed knowledge. Even in Europe it is admitted that religion is the opponent of science, and that science is the destroyer of the foundations of religion. While the religion of God is the promoter of truth, the founder of science and knowledge, it is full of good will for learned men. It is the civilizer of mankind, the discoverer of the secrets of nature, and the enlightener of the horizons of the world. Consequently, how can it be said to oppose knowledge? 
God forbid. Nay, for God, knowledge is the most glorious gift of man and the most noble of human perfections. To oppose knowledge is ignorant, and he who detests knowledge and science is not a man, but rather an animal without intelligence. For knowledge is light, life, felicity, perfection, beauty, and the means of approaching the threshold of unity. It is the honor and glory of the world of humanity, and the greatest bounty of God. Knowledge is identical with guidance, and ignorance is real error. Happy are those who spend their days in gaining knowledge, in discovering the secrets of nature, and in penetrating the subtleties of pure truth. Woe to those who are contented with ignorance, whose hearts are gladdened by thoughtless imitation, who have fallen into the lowest depths of ignorance and foolishness, and who have wasted their lives. Chapter 35 Predestination Question If God has knowledge of an action which will be performed by someone, and it has been written on the tablet of fate, is it possible to resist it? Answer. The foreknowledge of a thing is not the cause of its realization. For the essential knowledge of God surrounds, in the same way, the realities of things, before as well as after their existence, and it does not become the cause of their existence. It is a perfection of God. But that which was prophesied by the inspiration of God through the tongues of the prophets concerning the appearance of the promised one of the Bible was not the cause of the manifestation of Christ. The hidden secrets of the future were revealed to the prophets, and they thus became acquainted with the future events which they announced. This knowledge and these prophecies were not the cause of the occurrences. For example, tonight everyone knows that after seven hours the sun will rise, but this general foreknowledge does not cause the rising and appearance of the sun. Therefore, the knowledge of God in the realm of contingency does not produce the forms of the things. On the contrary, it is purified from the past, present, and future. It is identical with the reality of things. It is not the cause of their occurrence. In the same way, the record and the mention of a thing in the book does not become the cause of its existence. The prophets, through the divine inspiration, knew what would come to pass. For instance, through the divine inspiration, they knew that Christ would be martyred, and they announced it. Now, was their knowledge and information the cause of the martyrdom of Christ? No. This knowledge is a perfection of the prophets, and did not cause the martyrdom. The mathematicians, by astronomical calculations, know that at a certain time an eclipse of the moon or the sun will occur. Surely this discovery does not cause the eclipse to take place. This is, of course, only an analogy and not an exact image. End of Part 2 Some Christian Subjects End of Section 15